Hello everyone! When you think of games like Pokemon, Final Fantasy, Shin Megami Tensei, Fire Emblem, Tales of... Zillia, I guess? These games are just a part of the tip of the humongous iceberg that is your Japanese role-playing game. Even some games like Child of Light are not even made in Japan and could be classified as such. From games that make you run through the infinite hallways of fate to those that have a cosmic scope that defies the imagination, these games have always had rich worlds to explore with complex stories to tell. But, as they say, every good thing has a beginning. So, today we will see the very first role playing game designed in Japan Dragon Quest. At this time, a few role playing games inspired by the first version of Dungeons and Dragons start to appear on PC which began to be more popular at the time. Two great series stand out of the pack. First there's Ultima, a world of swords and sorcery in which Mundane, owner of the Gem of Immortality, must be vanquished. Lord British sends out his subjects to beat up various monsters and eventually you get to have a laser blaster and pilot a space shuttle. No, it doesn't take itself too seriously. There's also Wizardry, in which you explore dungeons in first person with a complex player interface and a whole party of characters you create. Both games, Wizardry in particular, were quite successful in Japan. And it is here that we meet Yuji Hori, a young game designer working for video game producer Enix. As he himself is a great fan of both series, in 1986 he wants to take this video game experience and make his own version of it. But he also wants to make it more friendly and accessible to new gamers because he wants to develop it on the NES, which is the in console in Japan in 1986. Another thing worth mentioning is that Yuji Hori is also a freelance writer for weekly manga magazine Shonen Jump. It is thanks to his connections that the editor-in-chief of the magazine was able to arrange for a rising star of his collection to design the characters and monsters for this game. He chose his rising star, Akira Toriyama, who was just done with his Dr. Slum series and was just starting one of the most popular manga series of all time, Dragon Ball. And then, as if everything was not perfect enough, Koichi Sugiyama, a very well-known composer of Japanese movies and anime series, gives a phone call to Enix saying he wants to write video game music. It is on May 27th of 1986 that Dragon Quest is released in Japan. Made with Yuji Hori's ideas, Akira Toriyama's charming style, and a classical music-inspired soundtrack by Koichi Sugiyama. Now, on a side note, I know that my videos take way too long to produce, so I asked for a friend of mine to take up the rest of the video while I play the next game so the next video can be done faster. So, um, well, I'll see you later, everyone. Well, good day, fine ladies and gentlemen. Join me and let me tell you the tale of Pat, the Dragon Slayer. It was a long time ago. The world of Elf God found itself plunged into darkness. But the great warrior, Roto, managed to save the world with the help of the balls of light, becoming a legendary hero for all the peoples of Elf God. The world has then known peace and prosperity. That was until the Dragon King struck Radatom Castle and stole the Balls of Light. But that is not all. He also sent his demons to take away the king's daughter, Princess Laura, and then went back to his lair to... Uh... Scheme the next part of his foul plans. Since then, the world has been infested by monsters, terrorizing the poor inhabitants of the kingdom and the neighboring villages. It is at this time that comes forth a wanderer, a defender of justice, protector of the weak and the innocent, paragon of light, Pat, the dragon slayer, clad in a dark armor and a helmet fit with blood-red horns. He came to listen to the king's plight and save the kingdom to prove himself the rightful descendant of Roto. The king gives Pat a toy along with 120 pieces of gold so that he could buy himself some equipment to embark on his quest. It might be better not to ask the king why he simply does not give him the best equipment of the realm, or he might ask for his gold back. 
after unlocking the door to leave the royal chamber and walking down the stairs. Our hero talks to the royal subjects for more information, even if some of them want to walk away from him. It seems entire cities have been leveled by the forces of the Dragon King, that many valiant warriors have already perished for this quest, and that none knows the whereabouts of the princess. After spending 60 pieces of gold for our club, Pat thinks he's ready to battle the Dragon King's hordes of foul demons. Well, I do not know about you, but personally, I think there's a definite lack of color in this tale. I will cheat a little bit and show you an enhanced version of this story. Voila. So Pat takes his leave from the town of Radato while running away from a fangirl and the Dragon King's castle is just there. Okay. He takes up arms and hunts for monsters to train for a while and... Oh, how could you hurt that thing? It's so cute. Well, Pat needs to train so he does what he has to do. As Pat wins battle, he gets some experience. After some time, from which the king can give him some idea, he attains a new level of power and his strength, speed and vitality increase, as well as his hit points. Later, he even begins learning magic. After traveling to the neighboring town of Garai, Pat learns that a demon was seen taking the princess eastward. He now knows his objective. He also learns that this town was founded by a bard who stopped his travel at this precise spot, which has absolutely nothing to do with his quest, but it shows that this world has a life outside of this quest. Thank you, villager number 15. Finding the princess means crossing a bridge, and in Night of God, this means that the monsters are much more powerful on the other side. And no matter the direction, the greater the distance between Pat and Radatome, the stronger the monsters become. It is also the same for all the caverns and dungeons that Pat comes across. Even the ambient music becomes more oppressive with each level. does get much more experience for more efficient training and more gold pieces to fit himself with better equipment. Pat then ventures eastward after fighting tens of monsters in one-on-one -on -one battles. As he travels the land of Alapgar, Pat meets with some strange characters, like key sellers who lock their doors. Probably the worst shopkeepers in history. There is also Cleo, who is married to a man who abandoned her to leave on a quest for keys able to open any doors. She let him go because she did not want to be in the way of his dreams. Personally, if his dream is simply to buy keys, I think she could find herself a better husband. After having found those keys and trained for a while, Pat, at long last, found the princess, guarded by a dragon. He takes sword in hand, and after a long and arduous struggle, gets slain. But no matter, the king resurrects him in the castle and gives him another chance. So we have a king who can resurrect anyone at will, but cannot ask his subjects to build a bridge across a river to attack the Dragon King's castle. Although he can give Pat a password in case he needs a break, or write his memories in the Imperial Scrolls of Honor in this case. Pat did notice that after his resurrection, he did lose half of his gold pieces though. It doesn't really matter as Pat does need a good training and these gold men will fill up his purse in a moment's notice. After buying the best equipment available and training up to level 12, Pat manages to vanquish the evil dragon and save Princess Laura. It is by walking half the continent with her in his arms that Pat brings her back to the castle. Of course, he could have cast a return spell, or used the wing of the chimera to teleport back, but it just feels much more epic this way. After that, Pat has managed to find the very same equipment Roto used in his own quest, independent proving he is Roto's descendant, which he found thanks to the power of the princess's love. 
He also created a rainbow bridge to be able to enter the Dragon King's castle and defeat the evil overlord. The story I just told you has nothing special, but Yuji Hori did open Pandora's box by creating this game. As time went on, the game ended up selling over 1 million copies. Yuji Hori, Akira Toriyama and Koichi Sugiyama will then work on every single episode in this series. Even today, in 2015, all three of them are working on the 11th installment. Of course, for today's standard, it goes without saying that Dragon Quest is a very primitive game. But you always have an absolute freedom in this game, which is still quite rare today. For this kind of game, the world always keeps an undeniable charm thanks to Toriyama's unique design and the often numerous writing. It is a world you can explore at your own pace that took me about 6 hours to complete. Pat, the Dragon Slayer, has slain the Dragon King at level 20. The game's short length makes it easy to pick up and play, and it only has one permanent save point, the King. Today, Dragon Quest is a real phenomenon in Japan, and it's among the most known video game series over there, so much so that this one is the least sold installment in the series. Many more studios will create other similar games with Let's admit it, more interesting tales to tell. And this genre of games will be called the Japanese role-playing game, or the JRPG. What's worth noting is that for the next decade, the JRPG will be the genre of video games with good stories in them. Koichi Sugiyama also released the first symphonic video game soundtrack by remixing every single Dragon Quest musical piece with the help of the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Three years after the game came out in 1989, as Dragon Quest IV was being made in Japan, Nintendo tried to bring the Dragon Quest phenomenon in America under the name Dragon Warrior to create a similar popularity. To raise its awareness and get rid of unsold copies, they included copies of Dragon Warrior for free with any subscription to their own magazine, Nintendo Power. So for $20 you have a $50 game and one of the best gaming magazines of the time for a year. They then raised the sales to 500,000 copies, but is it enough for the sequels? We will see that later. If you want to try this adventure, there's obviously the NES version. Its remakes though have a slightly faster pace, because monsters give out a little bit more experience in gold pieces, but the rest of the game is pretty much the same. The biggest enhancement, however, is the fact that you do not need to access the menu to open doors and chests to use the stairs or talk to people. You can play it on the Game Boy Color or on one of these touchscreen based apparatus for all of $3. Despite incredibly pixelated graphics, I suggest this version to encourage its still little known series in the West. I mean there are bags of chips that are more expensive than this game. The old English from the original is back and all the names I used to tell the story of the game have been changed. I would have shown you this mobile version, but I do not know how to capture footage from that. So I went back to an emulated version of a Super Famicom remake released in 1993, but unfortunately never left Japan. If the subject of the origins of the GRPG interests you, I have included various links of other videos that go deeper on this topic in the comment section. In the next episode, we'll see the game Chronopath is playing now. It is the first sequel of a game he already talked about, so he must be having great fun in there. Aren't you, my friend? Ah! I'll see you next time.